Returnal is a game steeped in mystery, with a story about one woman and how she managed to end up in her own personal version of hell, forced to endure a terrible fate and relive past memories that she wished stayed buried. How will she overcome this? We'll you'll have to wait and see. Today I want to talk about the story of Returnal, and not only explain to you what happened within the story, but also critique and analyze it along the way. Looking at its themes and design and how that connects back to the story, and how its elements of storytelling impact its narrative for good or ill. Make sure to like the video if you enjoy, and subscribe if you're new for more content like this. Feel free to check out my other videos, which are other story analyses, but on a variety of games and series. And as always, let's get started. The very beginning of Returnal starts strong with elements of mystery and intrigue, as we're first introduced to our protagonist, Selene. She's a part of a NASA-like program called Astra, but while exploring the reaches of space, she sees a signal for something called the White Shadow located on the planet Atropos. We'll learn soon, but this name is particularly important to Selene, which is why she goes closer to check it out. Upon entering its atmosphere though, her ship is shot down, forcing her to crash land on the planet's surface. What shot her down? Unknown, but that's the least of her worries. As after walking about 40 feet, she stumbles across another scout from Astra. However, not only are they dead, but the name on the helmet is Selene. Worse than that, there is another dead scout in the next room, but this one has a scout log attached to it, and the speaker is also Selene. If you're hearing this, you are stuck here too. I don't remember recording that. Shortly after, the player may start to encounter some enemies, creatures native to the planet. These are run-of-the-mill wildlife, but after a while, they start to get stronger, and depending on your skill, might be too strong for your current setup. Eventually, you will die. But death is a part of the experience, as dying doesn't reset you back to a previous checkpoint, but read the very first level. But just as the player has the foresight and knowledge of the previous run, so too does Selene. She remembers the crash and everything she did before. She even recalls how the environment in the first level has changed to something different. If you manage to survive long enough though, you'll start to see more of the world, and possibly become even more engrossed in what's going on. While the levels are filled with wildlife, all of whom are extremely hostile and primal, surrounding these areas are likely statues and pillars of alien-like creatures. Many of these rooms also have these same aliens depicted in authoritative positions, portraying a sense of sentience and order. Hilariously, these aliens are from here on out called the Sentience, but we'll spend more time talking about them soon. So we have a weird planet with shifting levels and multiple alien species that made this place their home. Fortunately, depending on who you ask, Selene won't be without a home either, as located within these levels is her home, the one she lived in back on Earth. It's almost as if the entire thing just teleported to Atropos and now sits idly by watching Selene. The house isn't the only thing watching over her, as when Selene naturally goes to investigate, she is stalked by a mysterious astronaut in an old Apollo-era spacesuit, who then seems to stun her, knocking and sending her back outside the house. Which is where our story truly begins. For anyone confused, Selene is indeed caught in a loop, forced to return to the very beginning every time she dies, only to do it all over again. According to her, Astra won't pick her up until the signal is found, so she's on her own for the time being. There's also a lot more to Selene than she is letting on, which is what the entire story of the game focuses on. Selene's history and her actions are the central core of the story of Returnal. Sadly, a lot of that isn't revealed until the end of the game, which is why the gameplay takes center stage. Surprisingly, Returnal is one of the few games where gameplay and story are uniquely tied to each other in almost every way. Returnal is by genre a roguelike, a category of games based around deaths, redos, and retries. Death and RNG are core parts of these games, and Returnal is no different, but it attempts to blur that line as much as possible by having the world shift like roguelikes often do. Every run on Returnal is different, from the enemies to the weapons to the layout themselves, no two runs will be the same. It keeps things fresh while also forcing you to stay on your toes, adapting to everything you come across. Returnal takes all of this and blends it into the story, showcasing how Atropos seems to shift around every time Selene comes back. It's a wonderful system, and weirdly was a game I originally bought just for this gameplay. Returnal released a few years ago on the PS5, but around the time I started to take note of the game, the PC version was set to release in a few months, so I decided to wait until it came out to start my journey. Once release day came, I played up to where we are now, before dropping it, as I didn't realize the game was going to have such a heavy focus on the story. So I decided to wait until I had more time, as it could possibly lead to another topic for a video, and... well, here we are. Returnal does an incredible job of pulling the player into the game and its story. I find it hard to not be interested in the story, at least from the opening moment, given what we just learned. It's a great example of less is more. It's like a horror game in that respect. Jump scares aren't always needed to scare the player, as sometimes just a bit of sound and level design can go a long way, and I feel like Returnal manages to encapsulate that feeling but uses it in its own way. Returnal isn't a horror game, not by a long shot, but it uses these same elements to invoke enough intrigue and mystery to keep the player going. Why is Selene trapped? Why is there another corpse of her on the planet? Why is her house here? Who is the astronaut? 
Many questions were asked by this point and were both important and interesting enough to me that I was immediately hooked. From moment one, I wanted to see this adventure through to the end no matter where that took me. Unfortunately for me, finding the answer was going to be harder than I thought. The actual objective is to find the source of the white shadow signal. To get there, you must cross through three biomes. The Overgrown Ruins, the Crimson Waste, and the Derelict Citadel. Or to put simply, levels 1, 2, and 3. This means you'll have to cross three whole areas without dying as death takes you right back to the beginning of the first level. The end of each biome also has a boss, all of whom have three phases. As you can see, it's not easy, and this coupled with the inherent nature of roguelikes, constantly resetting your progress and making you start from the beginning, was likely enough to filter out lots of players. Assuming you can make it through this hellish gauntlet, you'll be greeted by the final boss of the game, Nemesis. While Nemesis definitely stands out among the rest, I would say that all the bosses are gorgeous. The creature design is otherworldly, and the team really makes them feel alien, like they're directly out of an HP Lovecraft novel. I especially like the way they handled the Nemesis fight in particular, as it starts off like a typical video game level, an alternate dimension with just one large platform in the middle. But in the second phase, the game splits it apart, forcing you to grapple across to the other side, only for the finale to create an almost miniature version of the entire run, as you race from one end of the map to the other while fending off its attacks. It's absolutely gorgeous, and the gameplay is so well refined that even if you don't find the story that interesting, you could still get a lot of mileage out of this game as a strictly action-focused roguelike. Once Selene defeats Nemesis though, she wakes up from the dream realm that Nemesis put her in, only to come across the large device at the end of the hall. This is the white shadow that she was meant to find. This also means Astra can pick her up and take her home. Following this is an extremely fast look at the rest of Selene's life. She goes home and gets interviewed about her findings, relaxes, has kids, grows old, and eventually passes on. I know that seemed rather quick, but I pretty much condense an entire 12 hours in a one neat timeline. Returnal can be hard and unforgiving at times. Sometimes it's skill, sometimes it's bad luck, mostly it's both. It's a stressful journey having to reset back at the beginning because of one mistake, but that's what makes the ending worth it. You and Selim managed to stick it out against a planet that wanted to break you. You survived the impossible, so it's only natural that you get a satisfying ending to cap off your journey. Selene escaped, survived, and had a happy ending. Congratulations. Surprise, we're back. Even in death, you can never escape Atropos. Just because you die on a different planet doesn't mean you found a loophole, and dying of old age versus a bullet wound means nothing to Atropos. Death ultimately tastes the same no matter what flavor it says on the box. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to hell. I think it speaks for itself, but it's such an incredible twist, especially after what we just talked about. Depending on your skill, this might have taken quite a while to achieve, only to find out that it was all meaningless, and that you were as close to officially escaping as you were in every other loop. Atropos isn't going to let Selene off the hook just yet, as there are many things the player must see and more things Selene must come to terms with, but it's not going to hand this to her on a silver platter. Atropos actually plans on making her journey even harder by giving her three new levels to traverse. Now, don't worry, that doesn't mean we have to complete six levels back to back, as Acts 1 and 2 are separate from each other, so it's just another gauntlet of three levels. But seeing as we're going to be staying here a bit longer than we'd hoped, it's probably a good idea to learn about the planet and introduce ourselves to the locals. Throughout your time in Returnal, the biggest head-scratcher that comes early on is the aliens that have seemed to inhabited the planet. Most of these aliens, called Sentients, seem to have died before our arrival, with another group of aliens called the Severed being the only ones left. Left behind are numerous archives and xenoglyphs that the player can read, but will require a specific amount of xenoglyph ciphers to fully decipher. Xenoglyphs and archives are going to help piece together what's going on with the aliens, while the scout logs in the house will help us understand Selene. These aren't the only pieces of info that we can find though, as all the enemies and equipment in the game have an analysis counter that fills up the more we kill or acquire that specific enemy or item. My only real gripe with the system is how random everything is. It's not really Returnal's fault, more so a flaw of it being a roguelike, but it still doesn't make it any better. Everything but the house has a completely random location, since the levels change every cycle. So there's no way to tell what scout log spawns where, it's also impossible to game the system by noticing patterns. I went through this same door multiple times, and while I got the same environment, the enemies and items that spawned were different. Essentially, the only way to unlock things is to brute force it and hope you get lucky. 
Using notes and diaries like Returnal does is not something new, especially when it's placed out of order like this, but these storytelling devices only work when they're placed by a real human. Those games reward those who explore by giving them extra gear or notes that further develop the story. And while I'm sure these logs were placed here on purpose, it's completely up to chance when they spawn or even if you get the room to begin with. I feel like that takes away a lot of the emotion that can be derived from this. I wasn't happy or sad when I received these, I just was. That's the major fault of doing things this way, as it's less about being rewarded for taking the time to explore, and rather hoping and praying that the gods of Atropos will deem you worthy enough to give you one of the many items you've been searching for. The major benefit this system has though is that it gives the player the chance to experience the game their own way and at their own pace. All of these items may be random, yes, but that also means that they're optional. All the player needs to do is beat Nemesis to get Act 2 and then defeat the final boss Ophion to get the game's real ending. That's it. All the ciphers, logs, and xenoglyphs are optional. Hell, I don't even think the house sequences are required either. That means that it completely separates those who want to play the game for the story and those who want to play the game itself. For those that only enjoy its gameplay loop, you can skip all the pointless story beats get right into the action. But for those like myself who want to know more about the game and its world, then you get out what you put in. If you want to learn about Selene, then you could focus on reading the scout logs, but if the aliens pique your interest, then you might start looking out for more ciphers. Essentially, the more you use it, the more you learn. It creates another perfect, seamless link between its story and gameplay, while also letting the player dictate their own pace. Speeding through the game at Mach 10 or spending 10 hours searching all the locations you can find are both viable thanks to the game's design, ultimately satisfying every player. As for the lore itself, well it's actually kind of a mess. See, all the glyphs are written from the perspective of the one writing it, yet once again, one of these writers seems to be Selene. For example, Glyph 14 says, I was rejected from Olympus, our family split apart. I rose from the waters of the Okinawan Wenachi Styx. This refers to a moment earlier in her life when Selene got into a car crash, something we'll see later. So not only was Selene alive during the time of these glyphs, but she even managed to write some of her own, meaning she at the very least knew the alien language. This also ties into something mentioned earlier, as the White Shadow was not just any old name, as it was something her son said to her before the crash. It's almost as if Atropos is altering the world to reflect the mind of the visitor. Thankfully, Selene doesn't take up too much screen time, as most of these glyphs are written by the aliens. According to what was written, they were all under one rule. They also seem to be a part of a hive mind, as that word is mentioned quite a bit throughout the glyphs. For the most part, the aliens seem pretty normal. They had a large society of aliens and created large buildings for them to live in. Something you'll notice though is that some of the levels take place in the same location. Level 1 is called the Overgrown Ruins, and level 4 is the Echoing Ruins. Traversing each biome also sees you coming across the same type of rooms as before. Selene also mentions how the coordinates of levels 2 and 5 are the exact same. That begs the question though, which one came first? Well, I believe Act 2 to be set in the past. The Overgrown Ruins implies that something was left to grow and that nature has come to reclaim it. Act 2 also introduces similar enemies to the previous act, except they're called Protos, like proto titanops which specifically says that it's an ancestor of the Titanops, one of the enemies of Act 1. Furthermore, if you look up at the sky, you'll notice that the moon is present in Act 2, but shattered in Act 1. In this clip, I'm also using the photo mode slider to move the moon, so you can see that these shattered pieces move with the moon. Ignoring the fact that our solar system's moon is here illuminating the planet, which should not be possible, it shows that Act 2's levels were a previous era of the planet. The only counter-argument to this though is the fact that Helios, her ship, is noticeably more rusted in Act 2. Helios is a bit of an oddball in terms of everything though, since it's the only thing besides Selene that remembers the past cycles as it keeps track of her data across the runs. Either way, what seemed to be the start of their downfall was when they met with Chaos. A reoccurring character alongside Selene is this large tentacle creature with four eyes called Chaos. One day, it seems like the aliens either stumbled upon this creature or were more likely summoned to meet Chaos, but in return they came out severed. So we have the sentients, the aliens who were a part of the hive mind, and the severed, ones who are not a part of the hive mind. This separation seems to be one of the many catalysts to kick off the war between the two groups, as even though they were their brothers, the sentients saw them as anything but. As said in Glyph 5, our connection to our brethren was destroyed when we descended into the abyss, and although we felt whole upon our return, our brethren feared us. This then started an all-out war between the two, but one of the glyphs mentions how the bloodshed was unnecessary, further saying that they only wanted to communicate with their brothers again. Glyph 1 says, Our connection to our brethren is severed. Our agony is maddening. We cannot stop the endless cycle of violence to come. So not only did they not want to fight, it seemed like they didn't have a choice in the matter. This fits quite neatly within the game, as the two groups are the personification of order and chaos. The hive mind is one homogenous group, all united under one goal, while the severed are individualistic, and individualism often creates chaos, as there is no central thesis holding it together. Chaos basically created chaos itself. But that was essentially the kickoff to this whole charade, as the real finale might have been the White Shadow. Selene mentions how, assuming she understands these archives correctly, 
The alien civilization that died here wasn't due to genocide or suicide, but rather some signal. One of the archives even displays an alien peering into the device that we touch at the end of the Nemesis fight. So there seems to be a connection between this device and the downfall of the civilization. Also, while not largely important, this war also ended up affecting our bosses. Freak and Ixian were aliens that became severed, and Nemesis was a sentient alien, one that was a part of the hive mind, but all that was left of them seems to be their burning blue face. While this is all fairly concrete, where things start to get a bit confusing is the introduction of the Creator Destroyer. The glyphs specifically refer to these beings as the same person, never using the words Creator or Destroyer independently. It's pretty easy to surmise from the data that this Creator Destroyer is Chaos. But Glyph 9, which talks about Nemesis, says, We recognize that we had a role in this unsought genocide. The one with the burning face is all that is left of our brother's mind. Only the Creator Destroyer can now reach them if it's able to overcome the judgment that keeps it trapped in the cycle. The mention of a cycle is clearly referring to Selene, but that wouldn't make too much sense since all this happened before we got here. Well, not quite. See, Atropos is a weird planet when it comes to time. When we first arrived, we already saw two dead Selenes, even though we just got here, so it's clear that Selene has been here before, just not our Selene, if that makes sense. Furthermore, one of the last house visits sees Selene firing a cannon which shoots down Helios. But that can't be possible since Helios was destroyed when we entered the planet. Selene is basically in some kind of time loop paradox, where she crash lands on Atropos, scours the planet only to find the house, goes through the sequences, and shoots the cannon that destroys the other Selene ship, only for that Selene to do the same thing, repeating the cycle. We're just one of the many Selenes in the loop, so it's unclear when this officially started. This might also explain how Selene can use the glyphs, as she's been here long enough to meet the sentience and possibly enter the hive mind. Our Selene did not do that, though. She arrived very late to the party. What's strange about this is that Selene also references this creator destroyer, too. Most of the glyphs that Selene writes seems to be written with eyes and me's in them, as the sentients usually use words like brothers or brethren. So it's likely that this Selene, the one making the glyph, is not the creator destroyer, but the first Selene might have been. On top of this, one of the archives has a picture of a headless Astra Scout with the caption, the source of destruction, and the end of all things, referring to her role as the destroyer. One of the scout logs also talks about how some of the wildlife reminds her of the creatures from her books, mainly Gorgons and Hydras, reinforcing a popular theory amongst the community that Selene's mind manifested the entirety of Atropos. It should also be mentioned for the sake of thoroughness that the astronaut is mentioned in these glyphs and archives too, but only by the name Astronaut. So not only is this an actual entity on the planet, but it can be the creator destroyer. All of this is great, but what's Chaos's role in all this? Well, outside of creating general chaos, it seems to also feast on pain, or at the very least the mind of the creature it consumes. To skip ahead, beating the final boss grants Selene access to the center of the planet, which she believes to be the core of the cycle here on Atropos. Touching this always plays the same cutscene of the crash, which we'll dissect later, but Chaos appears right at the end and seems to reach out to her. Following this, the player is then sent back to the beginning as if nothing happened. Glyph 6 says, We saw countless arms reaching for the creator destroyer, a creature we did not understand, but they were never satisfied, even after countless feasts on its mind. By moving on, it could escape without suffering for eternity. My thinking is that this Selene that the Sendians observed was meeting with Chaos in multiple loops, and Chaos was feeding on her mind, which is how it's able to manifest these creatures on Atropos. Glyph 7 also mentions how the Severed shouldn't have followed the Creator Destroyer, so it's possible that Selene's insistence on meeting with Chaos caused the aliens to get curious, only for them to become severed. All of that is just my opinion and complete speculation on my part, but something to keep in mind is that Returnal is never going to provide a complete picture. Returnal is like a 1,000 piece puzzle, but if a manufacturing error occurred, resulting us only getting a fourth of the pieces, with the company not reimbursing us for the rest. So we have to put the pieces we have together and then figure out what the picture was supposed to be on our own. All the info in the game will never get us close to the full picture. It's a puzzle that can never be finished, like a loop that can never be broken. But you know, never say never, so we'll try our damnedest anyway. To reach our next objective, we have to make it to the Abyssal Scar, an oceanic abyss. It's a nice thematic twist, as Act 1 has us ascend a tower to find the signal, while Act 2 has us descend an abyss to the center of the world. It was this act, though, that made me really appreciate the detail of Atropos. Not only are the levels intuitive enough to understand on subsequent runs, so you aren't confused when you inevitably have to come back, but they also manage to tell a story all on their own. Level 3, for instance, the Derelict Citadel, pretty much spells out the entire plot right there. It's a massive citadel that likely housed thousands of aliens at once. Just outside, though, is Level 1, which, as opposed to Level 2, is the only one that can be walked to. There are numerous statues in all the levels, but them being placed here is rather interesting. The way they're presented almost makes it seem religious. Some of them are even striking specific poses, like these statues which have their hands in their stomachs. There are a few archives in the game that place importance on very specific aliens, which makes me believe they have some kind of hierarchy. 
This idea of placing some people within the group on a pedestal could explain the entrance to level 3. There are quite a few corpses on the roads leading to the giant gate that sealed off the citadel from the rest of the planet. This to me either means that some of the aliens were left outside and trying to get back in, or were traveling here on a pilgrimage. I am more inclined to agree with the latter, given that they are a part of a hive mind and to me would have no reason to cast out their brothers. Well, besides the one time that they actually did do that. Speaking of which, they too also have some interesting history implanted on the planet, as level 2 has similar architecture to level 1, but these statues are seen with red wrappings on them, along with ciphers that are plastered all over the walls. A few logs and glyphs talk about the Severed wanting to ascend, and how these wrappings were part of their final ritual. Equally, these large centipede-like fossils that protrude out of the ground are also supposed to be a part of this religion, acting as almost proof of their beliefs. So even though we just barely combed over the landscape, we've already come to many conclusions about the aliens and their way of life, while also opening up more questions for later. Such as the entire existence of Level 6. The Abyssal Scar is the oddest area of the bunch. It's down way below the planet's surface and also has no connection to Level 3 unlike the previous groups. Usually, if you don't figure it out by look, you could find the similarities in its design, such as how Level 2 and 5 share similar rooms but look nothing alike. 3 and 6, however, have no connection, as far as I'm aware, anyway. There are statues accompanied by large structures that expand far past the render distance, but I just don't see the connection. Since we also have to consider how this place became the Citadel if our discussion about the Axe is correct. Oddly enough, if it was the other way around and that Act 1 and 2 progressed in a normal way, then that would make more narrative sense here, but also end up clogging up the previous levels. It's like an allegory for the whole game, really. There's never going to be a moment where it all comes together and clicks. There's always going to be something missing. But there is still so much story that can be hypothesized by just looking at its grooves and edges. And I think that stands as a testament to the art and level design of this game. It's truly magnificent in so many ways, and is easily the best thing Returnal has to offer. Once you're done admiring that art though, you'll end up stumbling upon the final boss of the game named Ophion. By now though, some of the names I've mentioned throughout this video will have perked your ears a bit and for good reason. Many of the names used in this game are based on similar names seen in Greek mythology. Selene is based on the Greek goddess of the same name who is seen as the personification of the moon, which could also explain why the moon is here on Atropos. Selene's parents were the titans Thea and Hyperion. In the old house, we see a photo of Selene's mom with the name Thea, and while we don't hear much about her father, Hyperion is a boss in the game and there's a scout log referencing her dad playing an organ at one point, which is what Hyperion does. The planet itself, Atropos, is also named after one of the three fates, who specifically cuts the threads of fate, meaning that Atropos would determine the states of all mortals and would have them cut ties with life by cutting their thread. Atropos the planet hasn't cut Selene's thread just yet, it wants her to experience and understand something, and only then will she be granted the sweet release of death. Defeating Ophion finally grants us access to the center of the planet. Down here is a black sedan, something that, while strange, will be relevant in just a moment. When Selene makes it to the center, she sees Chaos who grants her a vision of the day she and her son got into a car crash. One late night, the two were driving somewhere before crossing a bridge, but on that bridge was the astronaut. This caused Selene to swerve out of the way and into the water. She sees Chaos down there, which prompts her to escape, but she isn't able to save Helios in time and has to abandon him. As I said earlier, Returnal won't be giving us any answers. Fortunately, there is more content to explore, plus this ending does recontextualize a few things seen throughout the game. At the beginning of every run, the game says Helios abandoned, which is a bit of an odd thing to display, but it refers to how Selene abandoned her son during the car crash. Back at the house, all the clocks say 8.36pm. Selene also leaves a voicemail for Helios during a visit to the house that talks about heating the food in the fridge for 8 minutes and 36 seconds, and a scout log mentioned that when Selene left and died of old age, she was alive for 63 years and 8 days. 836 refers to the time the crash happened. Also, this one jump scare ends with one of the lights flickering on and off, and it kind of reminds me of the warning lights on a car. Furthermore, the song playing during their drive was Don't Fear the Reaper by the Blue Oyster Cult. In level 4, which is at the start of Act 2, Selene mentions a song that she can hear, and it gets louder and louder the closer you get to the source. This is supposed to lead you to Hyperion, but the song he's playing is a piano version of Don't Fear the Reaper. On top of this, this scene is where Helios mentions the White Shadow, the same name as the Signal, and the black sedan in the ocean is the same car that she was driving the day of the crash. This is what gives credence to the theory that either Atropos isn't real and is simply all in Selene's head, or that Atropos is manifesting creations based on her mind. This is almost bluntly stated in Glyph 16, saying, quote, This time I act without thought and reach for the lost child. My negligence is why I am here. Selene's hesitation that arose when it came to rescuing Helios cost him his life, and is one of the many reasons she's trapped here on Atropos. What could sway the pendulum towards the planet being real is that Selene is seen with heterochromia, a condition where the eyes are two different colors. 
Yet in the cutscene, she has the same eye color, showing that this may have happened as a result of the crash, as this condition is known to sometimes manifest during traumatic moments. To me, anyway, it seems like Chaos wants her to remember what happened, as Selene has no recollection of these memories. In fact, when we first meet with Chaos, Selene even asks if this is something it wants her to see. In the DLC, which we'll talk about shortly, there is a poem called The Lamentations of Sisyphus, but the further down you go, the more it starts to shift the text. The original stanza talks about Zeus punishing Sisyphus for his sin, but eventually morphs into Chaos punishing her, or Selene, for her sins. The second line of She Who Cheated Death could also refer to Selene abandoning Helios and surviving something that should have killed her. It still doesn't exactly help define its goals, but at the very least, it does seem to want Selene to remember something. Which is what leads us to the secret ending of the base game. Given how replayable Returnal is, and how much content you'll likely have left to complete, there's a good chance you'll still continue to play the game long after the credits roll. If you do, and finish all the house sequences, then you'll start to notice a new item called the Sun Phase Fragments. Selene decides that she wants to set fire to the house here on Atropos, and to do that she's going to need more of these fragments. There are six in total with one for each level, but just like all the items before, it's completely random. The fragments do seem to have a set room that they spawn in, like here on level 1. I found that many others, including myself, all found the fragment in this specific room with the invisible platforms. But of course that is based on the assumption that you know what room to look for, and even if you do, it still doesn't matter as you have to hope the game spawns the room for you anyway. We've already discussed this earlier, but it's another reason why this randomized RNG system just does not work well when it comes to telling a cohesive story. Having to get lucky takes the fun out of exploration completely. It's no different than opening a loot box for a required story item. Assuming you find all the fragments though, you're given one final house sequence. On the first floor, there was a door that was always locked, but now we can enter it, and at the bottom is a single wheelchair. Selene talks about someone in this wheelchair and how they regret what happened to them, but unfortunately that's all the info we seem to get. That's because this cutscene is just one part of the story, as the reward for finishing this sequence is a set of car keys, and I only know of one car here on Atropos. That means we have to defeat Ophion again, as the car is locked behind the boss room. Having the keys allows you to interact with the car, rewarding it with the second half of the cutscene, which shows a grotesque creature sitting in the wheelchair instead. It seems to briefly attack her before Selene fights back, wounding it in the process. Before it dies, it calls out to her, and the subtitles show the name Thea at the bottom. The final scene is then shown for the perspective of the astronaut, but Returnal takes a quick book out of Metroid Prime as we briefly see the face of the being inside, only to discover that it's Selene. So she was both in the car and the astronaut during the crash? It's a little bit confusing, but thankfully we have one last piece of content to discuss. I can't imagine players being a bit annoyed at the end though, seeing as it answers none of the questions posed by the game, but rather adds more complications. Still, like the last ending, there are a few more pieces that we can add to our puzzle. This creature is without question, Selene's mom, but her design is rather peculiar. If we go with the theory that Atropos is manifesting creations based on the mind of the visitor, then this to me is how Selene views her mom, this disgusting looking creature. It's not the only time the game will do this, which is why I believe in the theory, but even the in-game items paint a pretty convincing picture. When visiting the house again, Selene might see a news report of a crash. This crash is not referring to hers, but rather the one with her mom. Selene and Thea got into a crash on the same bridge as the one Selene and Helios went on, but in this case, Selene came out unharmed and Thea was injured forcing her to use a wheelchair for life. This tracks with the creature using the wheelchair, but her stomach is noticeably large, implying that Thea was pregnant. In the myth, Helios and Selene were siblings, with Thea being their mother, so it's safe to assume that the child would have been Helios. Selene's child, Helios, is different. There's another audio log that has Selene talking with her doctor. The two eventually got on the topic of names, but Selene claimed that she already had one picked out, saying that it was from her family, implying that she named her son Helios after her late brother that never made it. This hostility we see from the creature is also representative of Selene's relationship with her mom. Thea had the dream of becoming an astronaut, but thanks to the crash she was unable to live out that dream as her spine and legs were severely broken. She grew rather angry over this and wouldn't have a chance to let this boil over since Selene got her passion for astronomy in space from her mom. Plus, according to the police report, the injuries Thea received were exacerbated due to her trying to save her passengers, so had she not saved Selene, she would have been fine. So now Thea has to watch her dreams slip away from her, all while her daughter gets to live the life that she wanted. That is why she hated her. Selene was abused as a child verbally and possibly physically due to this. It was always a bad day when Thea was around, and she was definitely going to make sure Selene got an earful of it, always reminding her that she was the cause of her mother's pain. Whenever her mother would call her, it was never to ask about her or how she's doing, it was always to complain. But this event caused a massive rift between the two, one that would get worse as we continue to discover more about her. The only part about this that isn't exactly clear is Helios, Selene's brother, not her kid. 
Going back to the police report, the text specifically uses the words passengers and them, implying that Thea was rescuing multiple people and not just Celine. Within the DLC again is also a newspaper, with the crash being the headline. However, there's a paragraph at the bottom that says that the police have not found a trace of her missing child in either the lake or the surrounding forest, but that a second child was recovered and unharmed from the water. Weirdly, that last line is cut off in the in-game reader, which to my knowledge is the only document that does this. It's almost as if the devs had intentionally hid this detail here on purpose. The mention of a forest though got me thinking about something else here in the hospital, and that's these childlike drawings of the reception desk. Each photo tells a tale about a girl and her family, her mom and someone who goes unnamed. One day they seemed to have gotten split up and the girl was left wandering the forest. While walking around she heard a voice call out to her but couldn't find the source. Eventually she did make it home but by the time she did she ended up becoming a full grown woman. The final line says, it's time to take flight to where the sun shines bright. My initial reaction was that the sun was a metaphor for heaven and that this was Helios whose soul was trying to find Selene and Thea but the pictures seem very adamant that this character is a girl, which adds to the confusion. Plus, there's also the question of who the blurred out name is. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this myself, but at the very least, the newspaper does at least confirm that two kids were in the car at the time of the crash. Celine, and who I assume was her brother Helios. Everything regarding Thea's pregnancy is completely up in the air. Thankfully, we do have a few more pieces of info to find, but before we move on to that, I know this video has been rather disjointed, almost mimicking the chaotic nature of the game's own story but I do hope that through all this you can see how wonderful the story of Eternal has started to become. You will feel extremely confused by the end, but the game does make sure things are at least semi-cohesive when it comes to the important stuff. Mystery is an easy way for me to get interested in the story. I wanted to know what happened to Celine and why she was being subjected to this. The game continuously strung me along with this pitch, and the longer I held on, the more enveloped I became. Like I said before, from very early on, I knew I wanted to see this through to the end because something about this was truly special. It was like something I hadn't experienced before, so like Celine, I wanted to get the answers to the questions I had. But just as the loop continues, so too does the story. A year after release, Returnal would get a free post-launch update called Ascension, which not only added a co-op mode, letting you brave through the dangers of Atropos with a friend, but also added a new endless game mode called the Tower of Sisyphus. In the myth, Sisyphus refers to the man of the same name, who is most well known for being the guy who rolls the boulder up a mountain. That's because he was a prominent trickster and cheated death quite a few times, so the gods cursed him to roll the boulder up, only to let it go back down once he reached the top. Instead of rolling a boulder up a hill though, we're going to be rolling Selene up a tower. As the name implies, this is a gauntlet of death that can't be finished. The whole point is to go through as many floors as possible until you die, and then do it again to get a better score. It is without question a perfect DLC for a game like this. Outside of the occasional cipher and scout log, the tower is a strictly gameplay focused experience, so for those that want the gameplay then you can kill to your heart's content. Plus you no longer need to reset once the final boss of the act is complete, as there is no ending. You can go as long as you want. It's genuinely an amazing piece of content and the only thing this game really needed, honestly. But the tower is not without its own story. The DLC adds more scout logs, glyphs, and archives. Some of which are related to the tower, while others help add more context to the previous conversations we've had throughout the video. It also acts as a continuation of Selene's story, as while reveling in the death and carnage, you will, once again, eventually slip up and die. This causes a hospital bed to spawn in the main room. These hospital visits replace our house sequences from earlier, and are to me, the most important piece of content in the game. Seeing the hospital reminds Selene of her mother, and decides to get her a bouquet of white poppies. Selene likely did this before in real life after the crash had happened, so she's trying to do it again in hopes of getting an answer. This requires us to get six poppies, just like the six sun fragments, and they are acquired the exact same way, yet it's somehow more annoying than before. The six fragments were random, whereas the six poppies are guaranteed to always show up on the same floor. Except you can only carry one at a time, as each one comes with its own hospital visit. So continuing on to the next floor after finding one is pointless. Each time you acquire these you have to get the flower, die or reset, do the hospital visit, go back to the tower, then go a little bit further than last time, only to repeat that five more times. It is agonizingly slow, and maybe one of the most tedious things I've ever done. I have no idea how they managed to make the gathering process worse than the sun fragments, but they did. What broke up a lot of the tedium though was the scout logs that appeared here, and while all of them were informative, some of which I want to highlight were about Celine's mental state. Going off what's heard, it's almost as if the tower has broken her in some way, or at least another version of her since of course our Celine is not the one making these logs. She's left feeling helpless after every failure, since she has to go all the way back down just to climb up again. One of the scout logs mentions how she's doing this to give herself meaning and purpose. She's exhausted all the options but the tower, so if this fails, that's it. 
She needs to believe that there is something at the top, so she has to convince herself to not give up, as if this fails and there truly is no way out, then what's the point? A bit unrelated to this, but there are a few more logs that present her as almost manic, mentioning how her suit claims that she's contaminated by all the blood and parasites attached to her, but she doesn't seem to mind, as she actually feels beautiful in her new skin. It's almost meta in that sense, as while Arceline didn't say these words, the player could be feeling this emotion. All of the Selenes in-game are really just all our different versions playing at once. Your Selene and mine are out there doing their own things separately, so naturally each one will reflect the mind of the player wielding her. Are you confident enough that you can make it to the top, or have you given up, wallowing in the blood of your enemies as you try to make sense of what's going on, questioning whether this is even worth your time? Similarly, those that have succumbed to the cycle and uninstalled the game is another way of saying that Selene gave up. It's a rather fascinating way to portray a character, especially if you look at this from Selene's perspective. All of these Selenes may be different, but they are her, so if the tower broke them, who's to say it won't break her too? It becomes even more concerning once you start to familiarize yourself with Selene. Being part researcher and part explorer, much of her dialogue is analytical, explaining things based on how they are, rather than delving into nonsensical, opinionated talks. When Selene first grabs the assault rifle, she doesn't cheer in joy over finding a better weapon. She rather notes how the weapon is similar to the carbine technology that they have back on Earth. Or instead of freaking out over the parasite grabbing her arm, she studies it, lets it attach to her, and then reports how she feels. To use a weird analogy, it's like hearing your quiet friend get angry for the first time. You're almost taken aback by it. Equally, whenever Celine talks about herself and has an actual opinion, it's time to shut up and listen as who knows how long it's going to be before she says something else again. Which is made all the worse when the opinions you do hear of her are about her abusive mother or how she went off the deep end thanks to the dangers of Atropos. Assuming you do push past the rooms and gather a poppy or two, you'll gain access to the hospital. The hospital visits are largely the same, with small parts of the area being changed each visit. Sometimes a new note will appear or another iteration of something will develop. After enough flowers have been found, Selene can then open the door. Inside is her mother Thea, but instead of berating her like before, the two hug for probably the first time since the crash. It's all a ruse though, as the body will disappear with chaos taking her place. When she wakes up, she recalls that this is how things actually were. No atonement or embrace, just guilt and anger. Like the base game, there is one last ending to acquire, but the hospital and tower give us a ton of new information that either adds or recontextualizes most of what we know already. So now that everything has been given to us, we can finally talk about what's really going on here. As mentioned before, Selene and Thea got into an accident one day, which probably left Thea bound to a wheelchair. As we know though, Selene would also get into a car accident on the same bridge, except she managed to survive, with Helios taking the fall. Returnal is quite a weird story with many coincidences, but it becomes a lot easier to understand when you look at it metaphorically. Both women, Selene and Thea, were mothers, who had dreams of being astronauts and crashed on the same bridge. It's meant to show how similar the two are, and how Selene has become like her mother. It's also meant to show the effects of generational trauma. Thea's disappointment in Selene affected her mentally, which in turn was passed down to Helios through her, because the other connection they share is that they both detest their children. Thea didn't like Selene, that much is clear, but quite a bit of evidence seems to imply the same between Selene and Helios. One of the house sequences actually has us playing as Helios. This is confirmed as much when you read the name on the door. In that same level, there's a voicemail on the answering machine from Celine, where she tells him that she's going to be home late. Celine worked long nights to pursue her dream, but ended up neglecting Helios because of this. There was also possible evidence that she physically abused him. At one point, his favorite plushie Octo goes missing, only for it to be found underneath the kitchen table. When he goes downstairs, he says that Octo knows not to go down here, referring to the fact that Celine might get angry at him, so he tries to stay upstairs in his room. It's very common for kids of abused parents to see places in their homes as off-limits. Rooms you don't want to enter unless you want to piss off mom and dad. That's what this feels like to me. Similarly, Helios ends up running into the living room at one point as he's trying to hide from what he calls the monster, which eventually revealed to be the astronaut. He is specifically hiding inside the TV until the astronaut reaches in and grabs him. But this same scene happens earlier, but from another perspective, as at one point Celine goes up to the TV and reaches her hands in as well. She also has a dialogue line that says, What are you doing? Wake up. These two scenes are likely the same thing from different points of view. Analyzing the dialogue likely means that this is how Celine woke Helios up one day, possibly because he wouldn't get out of bed or simply because she was already angry and decided to take it out on him. Celine doing the same actions as the astronaut lines up with the other ending where Celine is seen inside the suit of the astronaut, but I wouldn't take this literally. Just as this creature might be how Celine sees Thea, the astronaut is how Helios might see Celine. I see it as a representation of Celine's drive to become an astronaut. Back to that other house sequence, alongside news of the crash is another report about the lunar landing. This shows the two most significant parts of Celine's life, her relationship with her mother and her dream of becoming an astronaut. 
Relating this back to the prior scene, her dream of exploring the world is overtaking her responsibilities as a mother, correlating with the voicemail of her coming home late. Celine wanted to pursue her dreams, but like Thea, their child forced them to stay grounded on Earth. As much as she hates her though, there is also a log of Celine's that mentions how Thea was right when it came to raising a child. Celine figured that she could be a better mother and possibly stop the trauma that Thea imposed on her, but she ended up becoming just like her mother, doing the same things as she does and reacting the same to similar situations. Like the Abyss though, we've only just breached the surface, as I think we can go even deeper with this. This next bit isn't confirmed, but does at least warrant some discussion. Crazy theory, but I believe that Celine may have killed Thea and Helio so that she could become an astronaut. At the hospital is a police report that shows that a police officer got a call about a disturbance at the Vasos residence, which is Celine's last name. When he arrived, she was too distraught to talk, but the officer noticed that the house was on fire. When you put down the report though, Celine says the line, the price of freedom. This was one of those wide-eyed, jaw-dropping moments to me, as this was one of the most obvious confessions I've ever heard. We know that Atropos has parallels to things from Selene's past, so it's to my understanding that Selene burning the house on Atropos was connected to Selene burning her own house with Thea inside. This could also explain why we have to go to the basement to find the wheelchair, as it could be showing us where she was in her last moments. As for Helios, well we already know about the crash, but I also believe this to be intentional. I think it's fair to say that the astronaut is not real, at least on Earth. We know it's a real entity on Atropos since the glyphs mention it by name, but it's also Atropos. A lot of weird shit goes on here. To me, I see the astronaut in this moment as Selene refusing to acknowledge her decision, but instead blaming it on something else, while also reinforcing that her ambitions as an astronaut far outweighed everything else in her life, as it's the astronaut that caused the crash. Or more specifically, it's her dreams of becoming an astronaut that caused the crash. Still, this doesn't explain why she threw the car off the bridge, and I admit, it's a pretty big hole in my theory. It's also quite difficult to get a timeline of these events too. What convinces me that most and not all of this was intentional are two scout logs. One where she says, that's why I signed up, there are no attachments pulling me back, and another where she mentions how she has given up everything for this role. The wording here is quite interesting, as it's almost like she sees her family as a burden to her. People are stopping her from achieving her dreams, which is why she had to get rid of them. Another log also laments how Thea was never happy, but that she always saved her smiles for Helios. Once again though, after it's found, Selene will then say that now they can be together again. Further confirming that yes, both are dead, but her tone here is bizarre. There is no guilt or sadness or anything, just once again stating the facts as she always does. And it's a pretty cold thing to say for someone who just lost her mom and son. Everything about Selene being a murderer though is just my interpretation, and I don't want it to come off as canon, just a tinfoil hat theory. The tinfoil is starting to meld into my skull though, as there is still the biggest question that lies at the heart of all this. Is Atropos real or not? Selene acknowledges that Atropos and the astronaut are real, but in the same breath says that she can't trust her own mind. There are also numerous references to Selene not being fit for the job. At her house is a rejection letter from Astra that is next to her computer. And numerous scout logs talk about her mental state, one of which is about her delusions. It seems like Selene never became an Astra scout, which leads some to believe that this is all in her head and that exploring space was something she wanted to do but never could. It also might explain the car crash, as she was possibly lost in thought or angry over the rejection, causing her to take her own life. However, Scout Log 62 shows that after Celine gets out of the car, she makes it home and greets her mom, so it wouldn't connect to the theory that she died along with Helios and is living out her life in her head. Assuming that this is true though, that would then make Returnal a proprietor of the it was all a dream trope. While I don't personally subscribe to the theory myself, even if it is canon, it's not as simplistic as boring as the trope often is. Usually this ends up giving the scene no meaning, but I found it to be the opposite. Selene and the parallels to her mom are integral to the story, and the game has a clear inspiration from Greek mythology by using its characters and events to create another parallel to the story. Selene is in a manifestation of her own hell, either because the planet is manipulating her or because she's guilty of multiple heinous acts and is now being tortured for them in her metaphorical purgatory. Even if the main plot of Atropos didn't happen, the relationship with her mom and son did happen and were at the very least the cause of these possible delusions. Like I said though, I don't personally believe in the theory myself, as I find the story much more entertaining and rewarding if Selene had actually landed on a planet that is forcing her to question herself and come to terms of what she did. Regardless, Selene is still not done yet. Talking with her mom didn't reward her with anything, so now she must seek the answers once more. Her only lead though is the tower, this never-ending spiral that continues to push her further and further into madness. She believes that if she climbs high enough, she'll be worthy in the eyes of Algos. Algos is the boss that you fight at the end of every phase, who is unique in the fact that he only starts with one phase of health. The trade-off is that he grows in power upon each visit, having up to a maximum of three phases by your third fight. Three is the magic number after all, 
three levels in Act 1, another three in Act 2, and three more to cap off the third act. This means that Selene has gone through a total of nine different levels across the game, almost as if she's going through the nine circles of her own hell. As you can tell, he's a specific boss to the tower, and the only one you'll fight in said tower. Well, at least as far as Phase 3. I didn't make it very far into Phase 4. Like the rest of the cast, the name is based on a Greek deity, who is seen as the personification of pain. Fitting, given how painful this thing is to climb. This could also be a happy accident, but Algos is often a shortened version of the word algorithm, and Algo is also the name of a programming language. Which could link how the tower and the previous acts can be seen as an algorithmic sequence of different levels and maps. All that's required of the player is for them to reach Phase 4, Room 1, as doing so will mean you have completed the first three phases and fought Algos three separate times. Once defeated, Selim will question if she is finally worthy and thinks that she should visit the hospital again. Show me then. What do you want me to see? Is this all I get? Just an empty space where she should be. A moment of respite, at least. A break in the cycle. No pain here. This was earned. Chaos has taken her to a pocket dimension of sorts filled with nothing but emptiness. Inside are numerous other Selenes who all made it to where she is now. Despite feeling displeased about not being shown anything as her reward, she notices that it's rather calm and is lucky the first time she's given herself a break since landing on Atropos. So like the Selenes around her, she kneels down and rests, and judging by the others, she likely stayed here until her time was up. Even though the player can continue playing after viewing the cutscene, Selene doesn't comment on the vision, so this cutscene seems to be the final moment of the story. She doesn't go back to Atropos, her journey is complete, and the cycle is broken. It's not exactly a happy ending, but it's something. Selene finally understands what she did and came to terms with her own life. Her actions, decisions, thoughts, and excuses all came back. She finally understands and accepts who she is. While being able to go home and live her life would be great, this is as good of an ending as you could ask for. Plus, assuming that Selene is actually guilty of murder, this is ultimately a fate she imposed upon herself, so it's fitting that she doesn't get everything she wants, after taking it away from those that she knew. But this finally leads us to the actual ending of Returnal. If the commentary throughout this video didn't give it away, I love this game. The gameplay is utterly addicting, and I cannot wait to hop in and grind the tower again. The amount of items, weapons, and buffs you can find add to the diversity of each run, forcing you to not just go back to the old reliable. Sometimes the cards end in your favor, and you have to roll with the punches whether it means being permanently debuffed or having to kill the final boss with the starter pistol. Sometimes you just have to go with the flow. It's a perfectly concise gameplay loop that I never got tired of. The story, on the other hand, is anything but concise, but there is beauty within all that chaos. Piecing together lore from all kinds of different sources is exhausting but very rewarding, as I feel like I'm uncovering my own secrets, just as Selene was uncovering the story of Atropos. This video is my attempt at making sense of this chaotic amalgamation so that I could share it with those who may be confused. But as you can see, Returnal is a community-driven game, and only by interacting and sharing can we truly uncover its narrative. So if you played the game yourself, or came to some conclusions while watching the video, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. I've done my best to share what I think happened, but there are still many things I've left unchecked, all of which have still stumped me to this day. Such as the true nature of the aliens. Were they real, or were they just manifestations made by Selene? If the car, house, and some of the wildlife can be related to her past experiences, who's to say the aliens aren't also a fragment of her mind too? and that the hive mind and subsequent detachment isn't just a metaphor for something that happened to Selene. I personally want to believe that they are real, but I'm also pro-Atropos being real. Anyone who isn't could easily make the argument that the aliens too aren't real either. Then there's also the nature of chaos and what it truly wants, and most bizarre of all is the existence of someone named Alex. I'm not sure how relevant to the story this actually is, but nearby those childlike drawings is another one, this time of a family with the names Mom, Dad, and someone named Alex written on it. There is not only no other reference to Alex anywhere in the game, but there isn't even an Alex in Greek mythology. Hilariously, the only other thing named Alex is a book directly below it called Alex and the Giant Nectarine, which is surely a reference to James and the Giant Peach. Still, much of Returnal's story is mentioned and explained, even if we're missing a lot of the pieces. It's not as coherent as a normal story might be, but I think it goes without saying that Returnal is anything but normal. 
It's got a gripping and fantastic story from start to finish, one that really makes me wish I played this earlier. As of now though, there is no news regarding a Returnal 2 or even the company's next game, but honestly, I don't think there needs to be one. Returnal is a game that can stand out on its own and doesn't need a sequel to keep going. Still, it's going to suck not seeing another game like Returnal. It's a one of a kind in many ways, which makes it harder to replicate. All I know for sure though is that once this video is done, I'd want nothing more than to return to Returnal. Thanks for watching. Thank you for watching today, and I hope you enjoyed. Gotta admit, it feels nice to make a video that isn't an hour long sometimes. As for what's next on the docket, honestly I have no idea. I have a few games I'd like to cover soon, but I'm not sure which one I'll do first. Not that you need to worry though, since I'll always be updating you in the community tab like I always do. So if you want to keep up to date on the progress of future videos, make sure to turn notifications on. As always, like the video if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new. Thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.